we're back. Cause I'm not done talking about the Galaxy S8. Now I know I put that video together, all right? Galaxy S8 does it suck. A lot of people got all fired up. How dare he even put that combination of words together in the title, in the headline. Galaxy S8 and the word suck? Well, they kind of, you see, they missed the does it part. And then they also missed the end part in which I said that it doesn't suck at all. In fact, it does the opposite. Funny how that works. Human hearing and comprehension. Remember that when you were in school? The report card? Jack got a very good? No, he didn't. Failing grade. I kind of opened that video talking about a few of the things that were bugging me about the phone. Towards the end, I got to some of the things that I liked. You know, people were getting fired up. Rightfully so. I don't mind to be honest. One thing that came across to me from the audience is that the audience wanted more. You wanted something comprehensive. You know, sometimes I forget that I'm in this position here where you're kind of relying on me. Maybe you want to sit down with a bowl of cereal for half an hour and, and listen to me dive deeply into this device. So what did I do? I, I put on, is this blue? I put on a blue sweatshirt. I love this device. That's what I was trying to get across to you guys. Just maybe I didn't cover all those little nuances. So today's the day. Maybe this is the start of something new in which you and, and me, we spend even more time together in, in, in a video. It becomes an experience. We get intimate. All because of the Galaxy S8. So take another bite of cereal, sit back, relax. Here is the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to the Samsung Galaxy S8. Number one in the good category, in the good column, we're talking about this display. You don't need me to tell you how beautiful this display is. You've heard it everywhere. And if you've ever used a Samsung display before, certainly in the last few generations, and you know these guys are setting the standard. You have an AMOLED panel here. From a contrast perspective, whether it's in a phone or in that TV over there, the ratio between dark sections of the screen and light sections of the screen. Let me, I just want to bring up so you can truly appreciate what's going on. But generally, to the average person, a pleasing image has a ton of range between the dark portions on a display and the bright ones. When it comes to color, you're looking for this kind of vibrance, this, this saturation, and so on. Now I've mentioned before, this is an unusual aspect ratio, and it's an unusual curvature to the glass. Of course, they're calling it the infinity display. This is gonna give you a sense of immersion into the content that goes beyond the bezel. And it's not just the fact that it's AMOLED, but it's super high resolution. By default, coming out of the box, it's not gonna be in maximum resolution, but that's gonna provide you with some extended battery life. Nonetheless, if you want it, 2960 by 1440 in a 6.2 inch display here, or on the regular S8, 5.8 inch. But it doesn't really stop there because there are a lot of options here for configuration. Now in the first video, I think a lot of you guys looked at the way I was talking about it in a really negative light, assuming that what I was saying was that this was somehow disingenuous. And maybe there's an element there where I think Samsung probably could have delivered the max capacity out the box. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't all negative. For certain users, myself included, having the option to go in there and make those tweaks and, and configuration, for a power user like myself, possibly a lot of you in the audience, you like this ability to dive into the settings and, and create your own viewing experience. So it doesn't stop with brightness and resolution. It also dives into this blue light filter, which I think is, is one of the best implementations I've seen. So you've probably heard about this in the past where you can kind of shift the color temperature to something that's pleasing to you, or you can even have it shift throughout the day to help you go to bed at night. What you can do here is you can turn it on manually and get this warmer color tone, or you can schedule it. So it comes on at a certain time of night where you're trying to relax and, and you're trying to see these warm tones so that your brain doesn't think you're looking at sunlight and it refuses to shut off. Now there's, this goes a lot deeper into the investigation into human circadian rhythms and all this other stuff, but essentially a warmer tone should help you relax, should help you fall asleep at night. This is especially important on a Samsung display because 
it's got this kind of cool tone to it. And I'm gonna max up the brightness as well. But I've also got this video enhancer enabled as well, which is supposed to enhance the image quality of various apps that play back video. I mean, I did a little bit of research here and it's, it's hard to know exactly what it's doing. Essentially, you're seeing a bump in the appearance of contrast and a slight bump in saturation as well. It exists in YouTube. It'll also function in Netflix, Google Play Movies, things like that. Now, what you'll notice, I'm just gonna put this side by side with the exact same window on my Pixel XL, which I will also have at full brightness. It's a very well lit environment, so it might be hard to tell, but you can see over here, this is a more warm tone. It's got a kind of yellowish, maybe even greenish to it. Whereas the Samsung display on the S8, and this could be said for previous AMOLED displays as well, they kind of trend more into the cool tones, which that is my personal preference. I actually prefer this kind of look. So like screen to screen, this here is no contest to me. Sitting with, with them both on a couch, max brightness. This thing was like blowing me away. But without this whole setup and all this lighting, this S8 extends its lead in terms of brightness beyond what the Pixel can deliver. Now keep in mind, some of these features I just mentioned are software based. So you could go to an S7, for example, I've got one over here. With the latest software on it, you can adjust the opacity as well as when to turn it on. Some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about as pros in the S8 do also exist in the S7. Let's just, if you have an S7, you're gonna wanna know this. Now the next thing, the curvature here, okay? What this curvature enables is this kind of unusual experience when you're scrolling back and forth like this. It's really easy to hit to understand where to begin that motion versus a device which has a, a sharper bezel where it's a little bit harder to know exactly where to start pulling in from. Part of that I think is just a consequence of not knowing, looking down where the bezel ends, where the cutoff is of the actual touch properties. This device almost encourages you subconsciously to reach for that very edge. I don't know how much this is going to apply to every single user, but I get a weird kind of sense of satisfaction gripping from over there. That brings me to something else, this little side panel. I told you guys in the last video, I'm not a huge fan of this side panel. One feature that I don't mind, using the side panel to toggle device maintenance. And the reason I don't mind it for this purpose is because this stuff is generally buried a little deeper in the menu system versus like apps edge having your apps over there, in which case it's like, why? Like they're already right there. Same goes for contacts. I'm not calling that many people. I'm much more likely to go into messages, for example, and have everybody there after one click. Anyway, having this here, you can you can actually do some things quicker. So this one here is probably the simplest point and probably the one that you are most aware of. The screen is the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Probably not. No, screens will always get better. But anyway, today is, uh, it's an epic, Adventure. We're gonna talk about general hardware, the positive stuff to do with the hardware. If you're gonna have this infinity display, it's gonna change the format of the device, how it feels in the hand. Especially when you compare it to the old Edge version. Okay, the S7 Edge, which was kind of sharp, not very fulfilling. You've got a narrower body, so even though there's a 6.2 inch screen packed in here, it's easy to hold. Here's one that's been important to me for a long time and I didn't mention in the last video, so hence the comprehensive version, wireless charging. You see a nice little D-brand skin there as well. That's a little bonus shot for you. But underneath that D-brand skin, is wireless charging. I'm one of the few people that seems to care about this, but they're the last of a dying breed, so I wanna send boatloads of encouragement to Samsung to keep doing this, okay? You put one on your desk, you put one on your nightstand, you put one in your car, and you're never thinking about jamming cables in ever again. There's a lot of rumors out there that the next version of iPhone, the, the iPhone 8 or whatever they call it, might have that feature as well. So all of a sudden, all the accessories start coming up and then everybody wants it, but, Let's say for some crazy reason you don't want to use wireless charging. Guess what? You've got the next best thing on here as well, which is USB Type-C. Nothing proprietary, nothing weird. It's an incredible connector, lots of capabilities. Quick charging as well, you can see it right there. And most importantly, universal, all right? This is the connector of the future. Everyone should have it, everyone deserves it. Down by that connector is a headphone jack. A headphone jack is a positive thing, all right? I've got a. What do I have, uh, an iPhone 7 over here? Yeah, fine, you can use wireless headphones, but we're not there yet, all right? Now, listen, I didn't lose sleep over the lack of a headphone jack on the iPhone. I'm, I'm, you know, I can figure it out. Plus, they gave you the adapter, but you can't tell me it's a negative thing having it there. Put a headphone jack on there. Maybe you get a nice pair of headphones. That brings me to another thing. Now, I don't have this in front of me because this is not a retail S8. These are gonna ship with a set of AKG earbuds. These guys, 
Legends in the game. You kidding me? In the box? They might be. Now, I haven't tried them, but it might be. The highest end pair of earbuds included in a smartphone box. But let's go over some of the other things that Samsung is famous for and they're carrying forward in this device here. Expandable storage. You don't have that on iPhone. How are you going to argue expanding your storage later is not a good thing. Also, boatloads of RAM. They're bringing the A-spec hardware for you. If you're an A-spec kind of guy, it's in here. Also, water and dust resistance. This one is becoming a little more difficult as a differentiator for brands to use in the marketing lingo. Look, I've got some water here. We're gonna mix it up. You're sitting there looking for something comprehensive, so we might as well dunk it. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna turn the screen on and we are going to dunk it. And it activated something, but it should be okay. Here we go. Anyway, you get the point. No need for so much drama here. But water ain't gonna hurt it, dust ain't gonna hurt it. And listen, if you're talking about a flagship, you better be talking about durability at this point. You better be talking about it. All right, next up, Bluetooth. Now, it's weird to identify Bluetooth as like a point in the positive category. Because you're like, what do you mean, Lou? Like everything, everything has Bluetooth. But this one has new Bluetooth. I'm getting real excited about new Bluetooth. Here's the thing, I just wanna give you a quick breakdown on why you might care about new Bluetooth. It's Bluetooth 5.0, it's the first device that has it, all right? It ain't in your iPhone. The way Bluetooth 5.0 works, it can go up to 240 meters now. Now, again, obstructions and so on will obviously diminish that number, but maybe the promise of like whole home Bluetooth is an actual thing now. You know, we've got a speaker over here Sometimes Jack, he goes, even goes downstairs in the concrete floor, it cuts him off. Maybe with 5.0, not so much. You've also got more broadcast capacity. In fact, it's about eight times the previous version Bluetooth. Bluetooth 4.0, 4.2, 4.0, whatever. And what that means is there's the potential here to send higher fidelity audio over Bluetooth. So maybe we don't need as much compression. Maybe we just get better recordings. It doesn't have to be one headset either. You may remember a video I published recently where it was myself and Tom sitting right over here allowed you to pair multiple headphones to one single audio source by talking to one another. 5.0 supports that natively. Two different Bluetooth headsets, two different Bluetooth speakers, one Bluetooth headset, one Bluetooth speaker, whatever scenario you wanna present, you can now support that with 5.0. So that's, that's, that is a positive thing. I apologize for not making a point of it in the previous video and saving it for the comprehensive version, but you needed something to do while you were eating that bowl of cereal anyways. So that's why we're back. Next up, this one, kind of near and dear to my heart. We're gonna talk about software. A couple different videos. I've been talking a lot about the Google Pixel, all right? Because because the XL has been by my side, hasn't done me wrong. In the past, there was a wide gap between Samsung's interpretation of what Android should look and feel like and what was happening on the stock side through Google developers for like kind of the flagship software, so to speak. Some very pleasant things have happened here because they have trimmed down TouchWiz in a big way. I don't even think if they, I don't even think they use that term anymore. They probably they treat it like the plague. TouchWiz, bit of a nightmare for a while. Coming from a guy who's like I said in the past, I've tried out all these different Samsung devices, and what they've done here is gone with a far more streamlined vision. And when compared to stock Android, you've got something that is incredibly similar. I could choose to put apps on the display elsewhere. By the way, on this. Samsung device, that's not the way it looks right now. But anyway, things in general are a lot cleaner, in my opinion. And some of the tweaks and enhancements in the software are actually useful. Software has gotten a lot closer to the stock version and it should make, for me, the transition over to the S8 as the daily device a lot easier than previous versions. Okay, what about the camera, Lou? Everyone loves to talk about cameras. Cameras are so important on Smartphones now, they're the main camera for many people. No one has cameras anymore, so everyone wants to know. Like I said before, the camera has not changed that much, with the exception of the front-facing one. The software has changed substantially, and believe it or not, it applies to the old version, to the S7. With the exception of the Bixby button and those Snapchat-like filters, if I scroll over here, selfie, wide selfie, which is a cool feature, I'll show you in a second, virtual shot, selective focus. Oh, and I just noticed something. The old one has live broadcast still on it. I remember that feature when it launched. The new one doesn't have that anymore. The back camera, which isn't seeing too much right now, you'll see the same thing applies. Auto mode, pro mode, panorama, hyperlapse, slow-mo. Oh, video collage they got rid of as well. Maybe the 
retail version will have it, so long as you've got the most updated software, it looks like it applies across the board. The specs for the rear camera is still a 12 megapixel camera. iPhone on Galaxy S8. Honestly, you're not gonna see too much of a difference here in the rear camera. That's not really a big deal though, because this thing, the S7, S7 Edge, it has a great camera to begin with. Now on the front facing camera side, it has gotten a bit better. It's now an eight megapixel camera, wide angle selfie. I'll show you how this works. Okay, so I snap and then I kind of tilt it. And then I go to the other side like this. And then I end up with something way wider than what I shot. This is useful if you have multiple people in a frame. Here we go, virtual shot. And in this one, you move all the way around. I'll hit this and then I'll kind of do a little bit of this action, a little bit more, a little bit more. As I twist, the action takes place. Also, something I noticed, the autofocus on the front facing lens, super snappy. I come right in, it grips me. It grips me right away. Tugs on my heart strings, look at this. I don't know, these, these make me feel a little bit strained. I don't know what you're gonna do with that internet. I really don't. Look at old man Lou. What are you, you like that one, Jack, hey? You like that guy right there? Another thing about the front facing camera, you can actually record video beyond 1080p now. So if you're looking for like super high res, this stuff, vlogging and so on, QHD 2560 by 1440. And I am now recording front facing camera, Galaxy S8. Also, you can probably hear the audio from this right now, and you should see fairly decent resolution as well. You can tell I'm a professional vlogger right now. Just gotta go find my boosted board. Right, Jack? Cool, now the rear camera goes up to 4K, so it goes a step further, and we'll do a similar test. Here we are, it's the front facing camera. It's obviously very dark back here, not so dark up here. I don't know, on this screen it looks pretty amazing to me. Awesome camera, look at this, it's a love fest. Samsung, you're gonna be on the phone soon. To be like, Lou, we, we, we love the video, man. Here's the thing, I said at the beginning, it's gonna be the good, the bad, and the ugly, cause that's what you need. It's what you signed up for, and you're almost done that bowl of cereal right now, so it's time to move on. The stuff that not everybody's gonna tell you. All right? The screen. Wait, Lou, excuse me? You said all these amazing things about the screen. It's true, it's my favorite screen ever. It's the best screen ever. Does that mean I can't say that I don't like some aspects of it? No! So this screen right here, it's got this, this unusual aspect ratio, okay? Now this is the stuff right now I'm about to talk about that, that just sets the, sets the Samsung fans off into the stratosphere. Steam coming out of their ears. But with this aspect ratio, there are some drawbacks. It's not all good, it's not all roses. And you get these black bars, okay? Bottom line. So you're left with this, this punch in button, crop to fit. There you go, crop to fit. But then the, then all of a sudden, the head, it's, I'm getting cut off a little bit. That drives me crazy, even more crazy than the crop. So I just end up watching it this way. I'm not losing sleep over it. I'm not dreaming about it. I'm not seeing infinity edges. Love looking at this thing, but it's a bit weird. The fact that it's so tall, you see, I mean, I don't have, I don't have small hands. They're not huge either. I mean, they're average. I kind of want to hold it there, but you can imagine with one hand getting up there, it's a bit of a thing. Now, if I grab an S7, look at this. Boom, iPhone 7 Plus, who's getting up there? So everyone that's saying, feels so good in the hand. It's like, it's true, it does, but there are, again, some things to think about when it comes to this. Now, granted, most 6.2 devices, it's a two-handed device, all right? So get with it, get with the times, pull down from the top menu with your other hand. This Infinity Edge, as immersive as it is, can create some weird reflections. The reflection on the top edge there, and you can probably see this best on the overhead, it creeps into the actual frame, especially against a dark scene. Now, if this was flat, that wouldn't be the case because it would have to dip a lot further to pick up the reflection. And this is the reason why the regular S7 was the one in my pocket and not the edge. Something to think about. Oh yes, the fingerprint. Sensor, location, everybody's talking about it, so am I. It's impossible to ignore it, it's impossible to avoid. I'm not doing retina scans, I got glasses on, it's a whole thing, it's a whole issue. I'm not doing the facial scan, people already hacked it. Pixel, okay, nice, round, perfect location, not gonna be confused with anything else. Their camera layout is obviously much different. 
Are you telling me the phone would be worse if the camera layout was here and the fingerprint sensor was there? Or maybe the fingerprint sensor was round as opposed to rectangular, easily confusable? Or maybe the fingerprint sensor was, was down a little bit further? I don't know. Not a major drawback. Will not, in my opinion, change the amount by which you love this device. If you, if you want this device, you completely understand this trade-off and that there are better implementations out there. It's just part of it. It's something to accept. I mean, you can look at various Samsung devices from the past and you'll see that camera almost always lives in the exact same location. There must be some design advantage given the type of sensor they want to use. Who knows? If it were somewhere else or slightly different, it might be enhanced. It's something to put out there. Kind of get used to landing your finger right there. It's tougher for lefties. You touch this lens, you're smudging it up, so much so that when you launch the software, it actually recommends you clean your lens. Left-handed users, that's a lot less comfortable, obviously. You wanted a comprehensive video, you're getting it. The speaker. Yeah, right, let's play it. Let's go, let's do it again. One minute of charge time can provide two minutes of cell phone talk time, which in an emergency could be the difference. That's the maximum volume on here. It's See, easy to cover it up, listen, watch. Gone. Different from evaporation, right? This ain't science class, kid. When you already knew that. iPhone, which as you know, right? Speakers also on the bottom. It's possible to cover them up. Let's do a quick comparison. We might as well since we're here. I'll play the same video, in fact, here, and we can do an AB. Same distance from the you microphone. There. Ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol. Stove slash charge portion. A cell phone talk time, which in an emergency could be the difference between life I don't know how well it's gonna come through. Zombie apocalypse. This is a much more full sound. You can't block it coming out of the earpiece up here as well. This one is a tough one because speakers on phones in general are not really great. There's been so few phones that have like really amazing speakers on them, but this one is below the caliber of some stuff that I've got sitting beside me here. If there is a consolation prize here on this negative that the speaker isn't great is the fact that you've got your headphone jack, which you don't have on the iPhone 7, and they're including really nice AKG headphones. You wanted a donut, you got a cookie. Let's talk battery. This is something that I covered in a previous video. It's getting talked about a lot. The fact that it doesn't ship operating in its maximum performance mode. And again, this is a decision that Samsung made in order to enhance battery performance for the average person. Me, I'm a, I'm a bit weird. I like maximum brightness all the time. I don't use any kind of automatic brightness settings. I just have it completely jammed out. When you get to that last bit of brightness, it's in orange, kind of seems like a warning. And then if you turn on performance mode, it basically tells you, hey, you're gonna take a battery life hit here if you increase the screen resolution to the maximum and increase the brightness all the way. So it's almost like it doesn't really recommend it. If I go a step deeper and click on the battery settings, you can you can kind of modify it even more. And this is kind of a weird one because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck here in the negative aspect. So I actually like this here, which is that you can, turn on various power savings mode. Even, even look, I mean, I can go with the max mode here, which is not only gonna decrease brightness, change the screen res, but it's gonna downclock the CPU, change the way that apps are using the network in the background, and it can, I mean, they're saying it's gonna give me 19 hours and 25 minutes. Options are good in this environment, so you could take this for a plus minus, depending on which side of it you sit on. But one thing that you can't deny, though, is that the battery on this guy isn't physically bigger, doesn't have more capacity than the previous version. So the Edge has 3,600 milliamp hours. This one has 3,500 milliamp hours. And what happened here is you've increased the screen resolution, at least the potential screen resolution. You, you've increased brightness. This, this one gets brighter than this one. It's pretty easy to tell here. You got a way bigger display. You've got more modern specs. Theoretically, a faster phone should be more power hungry assuming you want to use it at max performance, right? Problem there is you didn't get a bigger battery to go with it. This is tough, because I mean, there's really not a phone that exists that has as much battery life as, as I would like right now. So it's more of wishful thinking here that maybe they went a slightly different direction, but it's got 3,500 milliamp hours. It could have been better. Would you have minded if it was a little bit thicker? I don't think I would have. Listen, you walk through the supermarket, you're in the produce section. You got the red delicious. That's the least delicious apple. Everyone knows that. Looks brilliant though. They got it all waxed up, shined up. It's got a weird foamy texture. It's not the sweetest, but it looks great. So you pick it up and you're like, I need to buy that. I'm gonna, sh you buy with your eyes. 
You know, and I think if you see this thing in a store, like, damn, look at it. I gotta have it. If it was a little bit chunkier, you might not say that. So they're trying to sell you on that first impression. But day-to-day -day life, long-term, you're looking for all reliable. You're looking for that battery life. So this is something to consider. You guys are power users. Would you take 4,000 milliamps and a slightly fatter phone? You know you would. You know you would. Software, I talked about it earlier. I talked about it in the positive camp. On the negative side, it's not completely stock Android. Not that it ever will be. And this is a small one because this really applies to me, Pixel users, old school Nexus users. But not being full stock Android means you can't be like 100% guaranteed that you're gonna see new features first. That you're gonna see the latest OS getting rolled out. Now granted, the old models, right? S7, S7 Edge, they've gotten updates pretty quickly. I'm pretty happy about that. But going forward, you're not necessarily sure of how your stuff is gonna be treated. Are you, are you gonna get the latest right away? Can you be guaranteed? For example, S7 Edge Batman Edition and also the Olympic Edition, no update rollout yet. I was sitting there trying to manually update. I'm like, where is it? Where's my Nougat at? But because of the skins and various things going on here, didn't roll out. So you can't really guarantee it. It's still not stock. It's a, it's a lot better than it was but it's still not 100% there. At some point, someone on stock Android might have some advantage over this software. Right now, it's a mix-up. Price is always, isn't it? It's a thing, it governs everything. The price is something. It's different for everyone, all right? Somebody wants to walk out and walk into a store and spend $6,000 on a fancy purse. It's not me, but somebody wants to do it, and to them, that's valuable. But if we're comparing apples to apples, no pun intended, smartphones to smartphones, then it's true. There's some stuff out there that delivers on a lot of what this delivers for a fraction of the cost. And the issue that Samsung has that Apple doesn't so much is that those that are scratching at their heels are running the same OS for the most part. Android at 300, Android at 400, Android at 500, 700, you name it, $1,000. In the iPhone world, it's Apple all the way. They don't care what you buy. Buy this version. Buy the old one. Keep paying us because there is no other iPhone version from some third-party manufacturer. That's a tough one. You always pay more for the premium, right? You want the best of the best. You pay more then you're probably getting back as far as the return on your investment from a performance perspective. It's more of an intangible, sentimental thing. Like, I've got the best. Maybe you feel good about that. Maybe that gives you some level of confidence you wouldn't have had otherwise. That said, I'm putting it in the negative category for price because of what else is out there at a cheaper price and how good that stuff has gotten. So you heard about the good. You heard about the not so good, otherwise known as the bad. But what you haven't heard about yet is the ugly. And I think a lot of you guys, a few of you guys can probably guess what I'm gonna identify here. A little something called Bixby. The name itself is not that ugly. I don't know, it sounds kind of friendly actually. It's kind of a weird name. Hey Jack, can you take Bixby for a walk, please? Please? Ah, a bowl of water for Bixby. Ha! Ah, that ain't what Bixby is. It's not a cute little dog. In fact, it's very ugly. It's a weird thing that Samsung's doing, and, and I don't know, am I piling on? Is everybody being critical of this? Probably, definitely. It's like when Google Now got launched, which is now called Google Assistant. I mean, they're trying to out-Google Google. Are you crazy? You wanna out-Google Google? And why don't you ask Yahoo how that went? Alta Vista, go ask them. Nobody out-Googles Google! Anyhow, yes, there are some features that, that don't exist in Google Assistant, like, the, the camera, you take a, you take a picture of, uh, I, I, we have a clip from the last video. You take, you take a picture of an object, it shows you other objects that are like that. Kind of weird, like I don't know, how is that useful to me? I don't know. I see an old car in the street, I'm like, what model is that? Maybe? That's a, that's a maybe. That's a big time maybe. You're kind of entrusting Samsung to figure out how to build this really sophisticated piece of software. This intelligent assistant kind of software which is not really their cup of tea. It's ugly for a couple of reasons, not just because it's software that I don't want to use, but because it's software that lives, kind of lives there permanently. Like I haven't found a way yet to really get rid of it. You can do more with it if you want, but when it comes to less, it's not really, it's not really obvious. Did I miss something? Is there a way? Where are you at Bixby? Can I, I'm searching for Bixby. We're gonna see here if they're, nothing. Nothing in the settings about Bixby. Good. Now maybe eventually through a software update, this could change. But for now, it lives over there, where you would probably want Google Assistant. You can still launch Google Assistant by holding down here. Boom. 
Look how comfy you feel. You start seeing those Google colors and the little little logos, and you're like, please take all my information. I can't give you enough. They couldn't possibly harm me. They're not gonna sell my information to the Russians. They give me Gmail and YouTube. But here's why it's really ugly. Because it's got a dedicated button, a dedicated button for something I don't even want. Ugh! Blech. Blech. Are you kidding me? It's right over here. And even worse, you can't really feel the difference between the two. This is something that came to me earlier. I'm like, why is my pixel so comfy for me? Check this out, Jack. Right there. There's texture on the buttons. It's something that I've seen in various smartphones. This one included Pixel XL, but also Motorola phones. You put a slightly different texture on the different buttons. And man, the confidence. I'm like, kaboom! This seems nitpicky, but you gotta remember this is a button I don't even want. I need to be able to feel the texture so I can stay away from it. So there you have it, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to the Samsung Galaxy S8, S8 Plus. I hope you found this useful, this, this comprehensive breakdown. If this is something that you wanna see in the future for high profile products, you know, let me know, leave a thumb. We can sit down, you can eat your cereal again, or pizza, whatever it is that you like, and we can we can go over every little nuance, every little detail. Also, important for me to say before I take off, because I think some people really thrive on absolute clarity, the S8 and S8 Plus are probably the nicest smartphones on the planet right now, as they should be, they are the latest. There are features that exist here that exist nowhere else. Bluetooth 5.0, for example, this infinity display, this really interesting aspect ratio, which lets you hold a 6.2 inch device in one hand. More pixels than probably should ever be in a smartphone, they exist right here. Whether or not it's worth it to you probably depends on the phone that you're using right now. If you've got an S7, S7 Edge, and you're happy with it, it's a tough sale because these things do a lot of what this new one does. That decision almost exclusively breaks down to the display at this point. Now, if you're coming from an iPhone and thinking about switching camp altogether, well, that, that's a much more ambitious move. I don't wanna steer you away from it though. iPhones, as we know, are set to refresh very shortly. Will it be an iPhone 8? Will there be a home button? I mean, who really knows? Buying an expensive phone is a commitment for people. I don't know what kind of upgrade cycle you're on, but I can recommend this device to you. You will be happy with this device. The Galaxy S8, probably the best Android phone right now. Let's see what the next Pixel can do though. All right. Goodbye, what I mean. Have a nice life. Do I shoot him because it was the good, the bad, and the ugly? Do I squint at him? I need a piece of straw like I'm Clint Eastwood here. Tumbleweed? We need more props in here or something. <laughs>